it is a privilege to uh, be able to co-labor with the Gilzons. They were unable to be here this morning. They were planning to be with us. They, as you see, are just having doing an awesome work there in the Ruqwa Valley. Um, you might know their uh, Jody's parents, at least Paul and Jean McFayton, uh, tremendous servants of the Lord. Uh, if you've been in this area for any amount of time and. They had to rush down, uh, I, I believe it was either North or South Carolina, and to see uh, Paul. Paul passed away, I believe, last night. And so we certainly want to keep them uh, in our prayers. But we still felt as a tribute to them it would be good. Uh, we're, we're so proud here at Bethlehem Community Church and the Missions Committee and all of you to support an cr- incredible work that is really occurring through them in the Rukwa Valley. So please keep them uh, in prayer. Your prayers, as obviously they go through a difficult time, but let me tell you, it's a time of rejoicing because if you know the McFates, especially both Paul and Gene, they were tremendous servants of God, and he just graduated, you know, and that's awesome, and that's what really, ultimately what we're looking for is to graduate, so it's always bittersweet when a, when a saint passes away. Well, there was this pastor, and, uh, you know, pastors want to communicate, and We'll try every which way to try to do that. So there was this pastor, and he decided to use an ob- object lesson to communicate his message. And he had four worms in four jars, and he placed the first worm in a jar of alcohol. He placed the second worm in a jar of cigarette smoke. He placed a third worm in a jar of chocolate syrup. And finally, he placed the fourth worm in a jar of good, clean soil. At the conclusion of his message, uh, he gave the results, and he said, the first worm in the jar of alcohol, dead. The second worm in the jar of cigarette smoke, dead. The third worm in the jar of chocolate syrup, dead. The fourth worm in the jar of good, clean soil, alive. And then he said to the congregation, now can you tell me what the lesson here is in this object lesson? And there was an older woman in the back, Maxine, and she raised her hand, and he called on her, and she said, what I've learned from that object lesson is that if I drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, and eat lots of chocolate, I'll never have worms. (laughs) That kind of shot the entire message, because that wasn't the point of that object lesson. And and if you're a preacher, you know that it's always a dangerous thing to invite, you know, congregational participation because you never know what people are going to say. All right. Well, it's been a month and we're going to get back to the st- our study in the book of Philippians. And uh, this morning I have entitled the message, The Choice. The Choice. Father, I just uh, thank you for all that has transpired up to this point. Thank you for the worship, and we're so blessed to have such wonderful worship teams, Lord. And I just thank you for the so many volunteers right now just who are running our children's ministry and youth ministry, Iwana. We're just truly blessed, Skip in the back, and our people who do sound, and I'm sure I'm missing many, many others, and I'm just so thankful for them. And now, Lord, as we turn to the word, I believe that you've drawn each and every person here this morning, and it is an important word indeed. It's really an encouraging word. It's a challenging word, but yet an encouraging word. And I do ask that you would fill me from the soles of my feet to the crown of my head, that the word that we hear now this morning will be your word. And I ask that it will truly bring life, that it will truly bring freedom, and that it will also bring an incredible commitment to you by the end. And so I just thank you for now what you're going to accomplish, and I just praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Skip, can you play the video? You know, when you look at our lives, our lives are really made up of a series of choices and decisions, and those choices and decisions determine our destiny. The Apostle Paul is going to challenge us this morning right out of the shoot with these uh, Verses in Philippians chapter 1, Skip, can you put them up? Verses 27 through 30. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing side by side, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Do not be intimidated by any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed. 
but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Jesus Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. There you see the NIV version. A month ago, I used the NLT version, and it says that we are citizens in heaven. And if you missed that message from a month ago, you can just get that uh, on the podcast or, or the website. And it is so important that we understand that we are citizens of heaven because Paul's challenge is that we are to live in a manner worthy of being citizens of heaven, a manner worthy of the good news, the gospel. Do you know what the gospel is? Do you know what the good news is? The good news is that if I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I will be forgiven of the penalty of sin. But not just the penalty of sin. See, we tend to focus on that. The good news is also that I am delivered from the power of sin. See, you don't have to live defeated. In fact, too many people have defeated minds. I don't know what you might be struggling with this morning, but if you are a citizen of heaven and you truly are, then you have the power to overcome any addiction in any stronghold. You can live victorious, and so can I. So don't, so don't believe those lies anymore. But you know, to me, maybe even the best part of the good news is I have hope. I know, you know, the best is to come for me. I rejoice with Paul McFate. The reason why I rejoice with him is because I know now he is experiencing something that is unimaginable right now. And that awaits each and every one of us. That's the good news. That's the great news. And Paul says that you and I, if we claim to be a believer, if we're a citizen of heaven, he says, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Joe Torrey. Skip, can you put up his picture? Most of us are probably familiar with Joe Torrey. He was the skipper, the the coach, manager for a long time for the New York Yankees. And, you know, before the season would start, he would gather the rookies together and he would always give them this speech. Listen to what he would say. Boys, it is an honor just to put on the New York pinstripes. So when you put them on, play like world champions, play like Yankees, play proud. You know what the Apostle Paul is challenging us this morning with he's saying that if you are a citizen of heaven if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ then you are put on the uniform of heaven and play like it live like it and act like it Paul is telling believers this morning he is telling us to live in a manner worthy of the gospel and we must be willing to stand up for the truth and not be scared off it might mean for a high school student or a college student, you might have to say to some cynical friend of yours or some cynical student, yes, I'm a virgin, and I'm proud of it, by the way. And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of God in me, that I'm going to remain a virgin. I'm saving myself for someone special. I'm saving myself for marriage. And that someone special is going to be the only one who ever gets what I got. And you know what? And you might get some, you know, ridicule from that friend of yours, that cynical friend of yours. You, you know, you, you might be made fun of, but you don't back down. Because, see, you're a citizen of the king. You're a citizen of heaven, and you know his truth. You see, to live worthy of the gospel means that I'm willing to stand up for the truth and not to be scared off. It might mean that you have to say to your boss, you know, I am just not comfortable taking our clients out to a gentleman's club. You know, uh, or it may mean that you have to say to him, maybe what you're asking me to do isn't illegal, but it certainly is unethical. And I don't think we should conduct business that way. And if your boss begins to attack you, if he begins to browbeat you, you don't back down because, you see, you're a citizen of the king. You're a citizen of heaven, and you know his truth, and you can't be scared off, and you won't back off or cave in. You see, to live worthy of the gospel means that I'm willing to stand for God's truth. It means that you're willing to stand for God's truth, and you're not going to back down, and you're not going to be scared off. It might mean in a conversation that you have with a family member or a friend that you have to say to them, you know, there aren't many ways to heaven. There is only one way. Jesus, 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Other religions cannot give you eternal life. Only Jesus Christ can give you eternal life. You can't earn heaven. You'll never be good enough to earn heaven. You must trust in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Only he can forgive you of your sins and only he can present you perfect to the Father in heaven. And if that person begins to get hostile, if they begin to get agitated and they cry out to you, how can you be so narrow-minded? You gently just respond, truth is narrow. Two plus two is four. And the only way that you can ever be connected to the Father in heaven is through Jesus Christ and his cross. Only he and he alone paid the penalty for your sin. Skip, can you put up that picture? Just let that sink in. You see, to live worthy of the gospel is to be willing to stand up for that truth, is to be willing to stand up for Jesus Christ and not to be scared off. Paul tells us this morning, do you realize that the unbelievers out there, they're watching every single one of you. The unbelievers of this world are watching every single one of us. The old adage is true. Most of us are the only Bible that the non-churched, the non-Christian will ever read. And you know what the question is? The question is what Bible are they reading? What Jesus are they seeing when they see our conduct, when they see our behavior? Well, now that we're all sufficiently convicted, the Apostle Paul moves on to verse 28, and he says this. Listen to what he says. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. Now watch what he says. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed. Do you understand what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying that when you and I will stand for the truth, when we will not be scared off, when we will stand up for Jesus Christ, and we will not, under any circumstance, it doesn't matter how much ridicule, how much harassment, we will not back down in any way, shape, or form. No amount of punishment can intimidate us because, you see, when we do not back down, we leave a disturbing impression on the unbeliever. Do you know what the disturbing impression is that we leave on the unbeliever? The disturbing impression is this, is that they are under God's judgment and that they are lost, and they are just about to experience God's destruction. You see, when you and I stand for the truth, when you and I are willing to stand up for Jesus Christ, the believer knows deep in their heart that this is not natural. The non-believer, in fact, is unnerved when he sees the believer being persecuted, when he sees the believer being harassed and ridiculed, and we don't back down. We're not intimidated because, you see, the normal human response is to back off, is to be intimidated, is to cower. You know what the truth is? The truth is if you rip off our shirts, at least for most of us, you know you'll find the letter C. You know what C stands for? Not courage. But coward. No, that's really the truth. So when the believer continues to stand firm, when the believer continues to stand up for the truth in Jesus Christ in the face of incredible persecution or ridicule or harassment, the non believer knows that something unexplainable is happening. When the non believer sees the quiet strength within the believer, a strength that they do not possess. Deep in their heart, they hear that convicting voice that says, you know, the believer's right. And if you don't change, you are going to experience the judgment of God on your life. Paul then says, starting in verse 28 of Philippians chapter 1, this, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed. But you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. How many here would just claim that you're, you're, you know, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that, that you're born again, that you're saved? 
a good number of us would. You know, Paul is giving us an incredible promise here. He is giving us a, an amazing assurance here. He is telling us that when we stand for the truth, when you and I will stand up for Jesus Christ, and we will not back off, we will not be intimidated. He is telling us that the Holy Spirit will supernaturally confirm to our spirits that we're saved, that we're really Papa's child, that we're destined for the kingdom of heaven. And you know what? That Papa is pleased with us. You know, you might be wondering as you look at those verses, why does our standing firm in the faith, in the face of suffering, in the faith in, you know, in the face of persecution, why does it become proof that we are genuinely saved? And the short answer is this. Suffering, persecution is God's way of identifying those that are his. Listen to this. Suffering, persecution is God's way of identifying those who are his. In fact, we are told this in, you know, uh, the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. Listen to this now, what Paul writes. All who desire to please Jesus by living a godly, righteous life will be persecuted. You see, if you are suffering right now for Jesus, if you are being persecuted for Jesus, this proves that you're papas, that you're saved, and that you are destined for the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever thought about that? It's a good way to think about, you know, when you're being ridiculed, when you're being made fun of. Realize that that's actually proof that you are really saved that you are really a child of God. In fact, we're told this in Acts chapter 14 and verse 22. It says this, that the believer must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, if you're going through, you know, persecution right now, maybe, like I said, you're at school. I don't know, maybe you're at work and you're being ridiculed, you're being harassed, maybe by a coworker, maybe by your boss. Paul is saying, if you continue to stand for the truth, if you will stand for Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit's gonna confirm to you, wow, you are about to enter the kingdom of heaven like Paul McVeigh. You are one of God's own. You are God's child. I mean, that is awesome when you think about it. So when I'm willing to stand up for Jesus, when you're willing to stand up for the truth, whether it's on your job, whether it's in the neighborhood, whether it's with a family member, the Holy Spirit, and, and you stand under that persecution, the Holy Spirit will confirm to your spirit, you're God's child. You're one of his. You're destined for heaven. How many here want your life to make a difference? I mean, I, th I think most of us, raise your hand high. How many of here really want your life to make a difference? I mean, I know that I want my life to make a difference. And, uh, you know, I, l let me just explain to you what I mean by this. Paul is saying this morning that when you and I will stand up for Jesus Christ, when you will stand up for truth in the face of persecution, in, in the face of ridicule, in the face of harassment, you are, you are actually creating the greatest opportunity for yourself to make an eternal difference. Did you know that? You are creating an incredible opportunity for yourself to make an eternal difference in the life of a non-believer. You see, when the non-believer sees someone with supernatural courage, when they see someone who's just steadfast in Jesus Christ and they don't move, they, they all of a sudden, maybe for the first time in their life, they see the barrenness of their own lives, of their own souls. Did you know that? When you sit there, just think about it in your work, and, and maybe you're making a stand for Jesus. Maybe you've said no to your boss on something. And when you stand firm and you don't back off, do you know what you're creating? You're creating a, a tremendous opportunity to reach that non-believer because, you see, they see that supernatural courage. They know it's not natural. They see that inner strength. And for the first time, maybe, they just see the barrenness in their own lives, in their own souls, and it causes them to consider Jesus Christ, maybe for the first time in their life. Have you ever considered this? And maybe your life is hell right now because you're standing for Jesus, because you're standing for truth. Have you ever considered that possibly it is your finest hour? 
It is your finest hour. You know, you're looking at someone else's life and it seems like it's all roses and gravy. But they're not accomplishing anything eternal. But you, whether it's in your family or in your neighborhood, in your place of work, you're standing for truth. You're experiencing ridicule. You're experiencing persecution. I guarantee you, if you stand, it shall be your finest hour. It'll be your finest hour because there's no greater way to impact a non-believer, a non-church, than with supernatural courage. And they want to know. No, I guarantee you, they want to know. What are you eating for breakfast to have that kind of courage? Paul said this in Philippians chapter, or verse 29 and verse 1. He said this, Skip, put it up. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting, look at this in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Did you see that? Well, I like trusting in Jesus. That's awesome. (laughs) Suffering. (laughs) Did you know it's a privilege to suffer for Jesus Christ? John Oros, Skip, can you put up his picture John Oros was a pastor in Romania during the communist era. And one Sunday he was preaching at a church. He was speaking at a church and he spoke these words. Please listen to what he said. During communism, many of us preached and people came at the end of the service and they said, I want to become a Christian. We told them, it is good that you want to become a Christian, but we would like to tell you that there's a price to be paid. Why don't you reconsider what you want to do? Because many things can happen to you. You can lose, and you can lose big. A high percentage of these people chose to take part in a three-month class on the Christian faith. At the end of this period, many of the participants declared their desire to be baptized. Typically, I would respond, it is really nice that you want to be baptized and give your testimony. But when you do this, know there will be informers here who will jot down your name. Tomorrow, the problems will start. Count the cost. Christianity is not easy. It is not cheap. You cannot be demoted you, excuse me, you can be demoted. You can lose your job. You can lose your friends. You can lose your neighbors. You can lose your kids who are climbing the social ladder. You can even lose your life. Let me tell you, he said, my joy when I looked into their eyes. and their eyes, there were tears. And they told us, if I lose everything but my personal relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ, it will be worth it all. Now let me challenge you. Skip, can you play the video? So what have you decided? Have you really decided to follow Jesus? It's the greatest choice you'll make. But even Jesus himself said there'd be a cost to it. I'd be lying to you if I said there wasn't a cost to it. But you know what cause isn't worthy? Think about it. What cause isn't worthy of total commitment and sacrifice? If the cause is great, shouldn't the sacrifice be great? If the cause is worthy, then shouldn't our sacrifice be worthy of that cause? Well, there's no greater cause. I want you to know this morning there's no greater mission. There's there's no greater thing than to put on the uniform of heaven and say, I'm on Jesus Christ's team. But there's a cost. There is a cost. I'm not going to deny that. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. It will be all worth it for you and me to lay it all on the line for him. I tell you, don't leave. I don't believe Paul McFate left anything on the field. You know, we had a a saying in football. You know, when the game's over, the gun has sounded, the clock has ended. You better not have left anything other than totally on the field. You, You gave it all. You gave it everything. 
I pray that at the end of your life, you will be able to say, I gave it all, I'm spent. I spent myself completely and totally on Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you, it'll be totally worth it for you. Because then you'll see Jesus with his arms wide open. Welcome, my child. Welcome, my child. My good and faithful servant, I am well pleased with you. Pray each one of us, each one of us makes that choice. And we, you know what? Paul said in that passage that we looked at in Philippians, he said, it's great when you do it together. That's why I was a team guy. You know, the, these individual sport things, it's for the birds, you know? <laughs> but it's great being on a team. No, and doing it together as a team. That's the beauty of Christianity. We, sh- we can be doing this thing together. That's an awesome thing. Father, I pray we'll take this message to heart. I love the Bible. I love Paul because he just lays it on the line. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't mince words. He just tells it like it is. And I pray now, Holy Spirit, as you're moving on our hearts, if there's anyone who's just been riding the fence, no more. No more. This morning, they say, no. I'm going to be on Team Jesus. I'm putting on the uniform. And I'm going to give my life for him and his cause. And it's going to be all worth it because then and only then do we really begin to make an eternal difference. That's when we begin to touch the lives of the non-church, the non-believers, when they see that incredible supernatural courage. That supernatural strength that they do not have and that's unexplainable. Oh, I pray that not only for myself, but each of my brothers and sisters here, and I pray that for the church at BCC. And I ask for this in your precious name. Amen.